Your Excellency, Alvaro Uribe, President of the Republic of Colombia. Your Excellency Enrique Peña Nieto, Governor of the State of Mexico. <laughs> and Graham McKay, Chief Executive of SAB Milo, United Kingdom, one of our co-chairs. <laughs> and Ferdinando Becali Falco, the President and CEO of General Electric International, GE International. <laughs> dear friends, dear partners, dear constituents of the World Economic Forum, and I want to underline immediately, this meeting is like all the World Economic Forum meetings, is very special since it doesn't bring together only the political and the business community, but many other stakeholders of uh, global society. And in my greetings, I would include not only you, our partners, our members, but also all constituents, young global leaders, uh, social entrepreneurs, women leaders, who have come here and who are not only integrated into the program, but who have their own meetings in the context of this special summit here in Latin America. But first of all, I would like to thank, on behalf of all of you here in the room, the government of Colombia, in particular President Uribe and Minister Luis Juanmo Plata for making this meeting possible. I would like to thank all of the personnel of Pro Export Colombia for a truly wonderful partnership with the World Economic Forum, in particular its CEO Maria Elvira Pombo and Adriana Suarez. The mayor of uh, Cartagena de, de Indias, Judith um, Pinedo Flores, and all the people of Cartagena have done a marvelous job and extended great hospitality to us, and I would like to thank them in a very special way. And of course, my thanks go to the other co-chairs, uh, who will join us in other sessions. And here um, I would like to mention uh, Luis Fernando Fulan, um, Luis Fernando uh, Alacón Mantilla, and uh, Mr. Uh, Sadia Raga, uh, the President and Chief Executive Officer of Banco Colombia um, here in our host country. And finally, James Turley, the Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of Ernst & Young. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to share at the outset of this meeting just three ideas with you. First, we are still in the aftermath of what has been the most serious crisis of the global economy since many, many years. It was not a normal crisis. It was not a cyclical crisis. It was a structural crisis because our structures have not been adapted yet to the needs 
of the 21st century. So there's a lot of discussion. There has been already this morning a lot of discussion whether we face a W-shaped or U-shaped recovery. We don't know yet. We only know that we still have to pay a serious price for the errors which were committed in the past. But there's one good news. Latin America will probably, if there are no other major events in the geopolitical or geoeconomic context, will have a V-shaped recovery, a small dip and fast improvement. And I think this speaks for the resilience of the Latin American economies and what has been achieved, particularly also in this country during the last uh, years. Of course, there are still many challenges to, to be met, and we will devote sufficient time for discussion to all those challenges like democracy, like governance, like crime, and I could go on. But it seems to me, coming here since many, many years to Latin America, it seems to me that Latin America moved what is now called the period of the lost decades at the end of the last century. And the first 10 years of this century, we could call the decade, at least for some of the countries, the decade of promise. The fundaments have been let down to create in the next decade a fast-growing, sustained economic and social development. Now, the last thought which I wanted to share with you, the World Economic Forum usually is holding its meetings in large countries, in the top countries of a region, and I would nearly take a comparison with sports. If you take, for example, the BRIC countries, we speak about the Super League. But actually, what will count in the world very much, the world of tomorrow, is the League of the New Champions. So we decided to pay our tribute to the best new champion, at least in this part of the world, to Colombia. <laughs> Mr. President, you have made Colombia an economic success story, as evidenced, for example, by the World Bank, this year calling Colombia the most business-friendly country in Latin America. And I could quote many other impressive figures showing the success of your turnaround policies. But, Mr. President, I think something else is even more important. There is no doubt that particularly your security program, based on a policy of democratic security, has transformed deeply Colombia and has brought all of us to Colombia with an incredible interest to witness firsthand the bright future of this wonderful country and its citizens. Mr. President, I have the honor to ask you to open officially this summit on Latin America of the World Economic Forum. Honorable Professor. Honorable Professor Klaus Schwartz, Director and Founder of the World Economic Forum. Don Emilio Lozoya Austin, General Director of the World Economic Forum for Latin America. President of General Electric, Fernando Vitani. Executive Director, Sam Miller and Graham McKay. Governor 
of the state of Mexico, Enrique Peña Nieto, His Excellency, the President of Panama, Ricardo Martinelli, Vice President of the Republic, Francisco Santos Calderón, ex-presidents, distinguished colleagues in the government, Minister of Commerce and Tourism, Luis Guillermo Plata, distinguished colleagues of an sport, Funda Sport, distinguished attendants, friends of the media, welcome to Cartagena one of the cradles of American independence, a relic of history, a treasure of the present and the future. Thank you, Professor Trump. You, Don Emilio, and all those who accompany you. Thank you for this trust that you have placed in Colombia for having allowed this city of Cartagena on behalf of all of Colombia to be the venue of this very important event. We wish to applaud you. We wish to applaud you, your wife, and your team. I would like to thank all of you, distinguished international visitors, for your presence in Cartagena. On behalf of the mayor of the entire community of Cartagena, I would like to thank you very much. I thank my colleagues in the government, to the team headed by Luis Guillermo Plata, the Minister of Industry, Trade, and Tourism, and by Maria Elvira Pombo, who is director of the Export Promotion Agency and Investment for all the efforts that they have made. This sh shows trust in Colombia, confidence, the confidence that we have sought to deepen over the years. This confidence and trust that we have sought through security with democratic values, investment with social responsibility, and social cohesion. Security is a source of resource, courses. Security is a democratic value. It is one of the foundations without which investment cannot come. And of course, security for investment generates the possibility of building social cohesion, which in turn, in a democratic society, operates as the validator of security and the promotion of investment. We have reduced the rate of homicides from 66 per 100,000 inhabitants to 32. Several of our cities already appear as highly secure cities in the continent and in the world. The goal for 2015 is for us to have a rate of homicides that does not exceed those of the developed countries. We have reduced the number of kidnappings to 6% of what it used to be. And there is great determination throughout the country to do away with the scourge. The very few numbers of kidnappings that still take place and in the struggle to eliminate them in which we are carrying out, this occur in very remote areas of Colombia. Our armed forces deserve our homage. Colombia produced from 800 to 1,000 tons of cocaine. We have been able to overcome this scourge year after year. In the last international report, it is stated that Colombia lowered production to 400 tons. And the number of seizures have made it possible for less than half to be able 
to go to external markets. Of course, we still have a great deal to do in order to recover safety to defeat drug trafficking that has nourished this insecurity. There is full determination among the majority of Colombians to win this battle. It was estimated before that drug trafficking accounted for 6% of our economy. It still has some weight. It still accounts for 1%. We could speak of the intangible aspects of democratic security. I would refer only to three. We have recovered the monopoly that we should have never lost of the state to combat criminals and to administer justice. The elimination of paramilitary groups has made it possible for Colombia to recover through its armed forces the monopoly to fight against criminals. The armed forces of Colombia are the only ones that combat against criminals. Before, victims did not complain because they were afraid or because they thought it was useless, but now there is trust. 280,000 victims have presented their complaints, and we have made significant efforts to provide them with reparation. We know that there is no such thing as total reparation, but all of these reparation efforts eliminates the possibilities of revenge. It eliminates the germs of hatred. The most important form of reparation is to ensure the new generations that they will have the right to non-repetition. This is our struggle. And there is something that I want you to bear with you, to carry with you in your hearts and in your minds, that Colombia has confronted this challenge of very powerful and wealthy terrorism, which does not require international donations because it is self-feeding from drug trafficking. Colombia has confronted this challenge with full respect for democratic guarantees, for civil rights, for political rights, for freedoms. It is very important in all study groups and think tanks to consider that for us, it has, the effectiveness of this policy has been so important as well as adhesion to human rights. The effectiveness of this policy as well as respect for democratic liberties. This policy has been governed by ordinary law and not by martial law. The second pillar of our road to build confidence is the promotion of investment. First of all, we ratify our faith in private initiative. Without private initiative, there is no prosperity. History has been mistaken very often when it has tried to restrict or eliminate private initiative. Liberty and Private initiative are not guaranteed. In Latin America, there are many attacks against private initiative, but Colombia repeats all its faith in private initiative with social responsibility. This is the road. In order to solve the problems of poverty and to build equity, without private, equi private initiative, there is no equity. Without this, the mind of people's is jailed in. There is no investment. Without private initiative, communities drop their efforts and to work. We lose the dynamics of work. In those countries whose systems, communist systems, collapse, these show that because of the lack of private initiative, they lost out in their standards of living and led to the collapse of their systems. We have been able to achieve over these years enjoying good economic development between 2006 and 2007. It fell in 2008 in 2.4. In 2009, in the midst of such difficult circumstances, we're able to achieve positive growth of 
zero four. Although we suffered the effects of the international crisis, and a crisis with the market in, with regard to Venezuela, Colombia has begun to show inflation of a developed country. In the last 12 months, we have had the lowest inflation of the last 55 years of 1.84. We had reduced the consolidated deficit nearly to the balance, to an equilibrium, and the national central government that pays pensions and pays debts and makes transference to the different region, we had reduced this from 6.5 to 2.3. In order to confront the crisis, the consolidated deficit increased to 3.2%. And the deficit of the national central government increased to 4.1%. We are confident that it will not exceed 4.4%. The indebtedness of the public sector had dropped to 48% of the GDP from to, to 22. So we trust that the efforts that we have been able to make because of the crisis, will not increase it to 27%. We have reformed 431 government entities. We believe that Latin America has been mistaken during those decades in which it tried to eliminate the state and during those decades when it tried to eliminate private initiative. We have reformed 431 state entities. And I will refer to a few cases. The petroleum enterprise has undergone three reforms. One, which is the labor reform, also a pension reform, and subsequently, after a democratic process at the National Congress, there was an approval for capitalization by private citizens, which is 10 per 5 percent of its share stock. This company would, would invite, invested $500 million a year, but in 2009 and in 2010, it had, these sums have increased to more than $7 billion. Colombia was condemned to, to lose its oil self-dependency by 2008. We are consuming 228 barrels a day. Uh, we should be producing less, but we're producing 785,000. We trust that in a few months we will be able to produce 1 million barrels a day, and in a few years to be able to produce 1.5 million barrels of oil. We carried out a reform of the National Telecommunications Company. It used to be a negative aspect of the state. At present, it is positive under the mixed company form. We have to recognize what it's still lacking. Now we have to under have a third reform of this company so that it may have shareholders that will participate in mobile telephones. And to speak of a sector of which very little has been said, we have reformed 425 clinics in this country. And the clinics of the Social Security have, have become socially efficient. They have not been closed down, but they no longer are handled under the old clientele system with the old politicking form. They are being managed as social entities for, with nonprofit purposes. If you asked me what our main inheritance it will be for the healthy um, economy of Colombia. I would just mention, too, the reform of state entities and bringing down subsidies to fuels. This country should be paying at present $3 billion a year for oil subsidies, for fuel subsidies. Colombians have heroically been absorbing a very significant increase of prices domestically, but this is good for the present, for the future. It brings us into healthy public finances. 
We have a tax system which includes incentives. We cannot tax in the same way those who invest and those who don't invest. We have introduced very important incentives for taxation, the law of stability that makes it possible to have 20-year agreements to ensure the stability of the rules of the game in favor of investors. Prosperity and employment, in our concept, these pertain to security, to promotion of investment, to market access. From 1989 and 2003, Colombia opened its economy unilaterally, but it had very restricted accesses to markets, only to the Andean community and an agreement with Mexico. Given today's needs, this has to be deepened. We hope that by August of this year, we will have entered into agreements with 45 countries in the process of Colombia's in entry into the world economy. When investors perceive that there is legal certainty and access to markets, the question is, what are we going to sell? Colombia is carrying out a very intensive process of innovative production through concerted agreement between the state and private individuals. And <coughs> innovative production requires a constant educational revolution, and I will refer to this. Of course, there is a sixth element which is very important for prosperity and employment, I infrastructure. In our capital city, Bogota, located on the most beautiful savanna of the Los Angeles Cordillera. We have 1,070 kilometers, a topography that is very difficult in our Andean nation. We're in the process of, of having Colombia be ahead in infrastructure. This is one of the most important infrastructure projects is the building of that road as a highway between our capital city and the Caribbean. We have moved ahead very much with regard to ports through private incentive and tax incentives. We have made much headway in the mass transportation area. We are building in nine Colombia cities, and other 10 will also have these facilities. The world has confidence to generate energy in Colombia. We had a capacity of 13,000 megas a year and a half. We awarded to independent companies the installation of 4,000 more megas. Generators of energy in Colombia at present have the stimulus of a free trade area. The guarantee of a compensation for investment through the cargo for reliability, an agreement of stability of the rules of the game for 20 years. We believe that we have a social responsibility in terms of investment. We feel that we need transparency in our relations with the state and that we have to comply with the environmental laws and that we don't want to have hatred among classes. We need brotherhood. In Latin America, there has uh, been a criticism to what may have been the causes of the world economy, which is uh, speculative movements. And we also uh, firmly believe in social responsibility. We have to reorient the definition of capital. We have to view capital and investment as factors for construction, not speculation, but rather to uh, develop uh, social wealth. Colombia has improved in terms of its competitiveness. For three years, the World Bank has uh, viewed Colombia as one of the countries that has made more progress in doing business. And today, we are the first country in Latin America in terms of doing business. Also, the um, Economic Competitiveness Forum acknowledged that Colombia has made significant headway as well. And the UN, the United Nations, has stated that Colombia together with Peru and uh, after Chile is the country that has made more progress in the Human Development Index. 
We've also been uh, certified in terms of our improvements in uh, our opportunity uh, index. In Latin America, last year, uh, we had 9 million more poor people. However, Colombia was able to reduce poverty rates. And throughout uh, my administration, per capita expenses in favor of the poorest have gone from 200 to 414 dollars. Last year, when we weighed the uh, public and private investment rate, Colombia that had has had the highest investment rate in Latin America. It was 25.8. And if we break it down by sectors, we find that in industrial equipment, throughout my administration, we went uh, from 4 to 9.5%. Today, Colombia, that has 46 million people, has uh, 43 million people that have a health insurance. And we've been working in favor of an educational revolution. We have a total coverage in basic education, over 80% coverage in middle education. And throughout my administration, we've gone from 22 to 36 percent in terms of university coverage. And today, we're leaders in terms of uh, vocational training. Colombia uh, has uh, trained 7.8 million uh, people in um, different trades. So we're really making an effort to favor the poorest sectors of our population. For example, in terms of microcredits, in order to give uh, ac loan to access to the poorest. And in our administration, we've gone up to uh, $4 billion in terms of uh, micro loans. And Cartagena is an example uh, in terms of what we've been trying to do in uh, this administration. We've made headway in terms of our security uh, policy, investment policy, and likewise in our social policy. Uh, dear visitors, our city uh, very quickly went from uh, 500,000 inhabitants to 1 million. Very many uh, people were displaced from other areas and uh, came to Cartagena. And uh, being able to overcome these problems have been costly and has taken time. But uh, has taken time. But we've been doing networking so that all the poor families can uh, benefit from these. Uh, social well-being measures so that they can overcome poverty. I'd like to make uh, two final comments. We want to have good relations with all the countries in the world. Uh, we have a partnership with the U.S. in order to work jointly, to work together in order to fight uh, narco-terrorism, drugs and terrorism. And we do have domestic problems that we are overcoming, but we're not involved in the international arms race. The only thing that we request from our neighbors is that uh, nobody uh, no country be a haven for Colombian terrorists, because Colombia is entitled to do away with the threat of terrorism. I'm very concerned uh, to see that many Latin American uh, countries uh, despise sec the security, security to a certain extent. Uh, they have uh, greater problems in terms of security. They've paid no attention to it. And they may be, in future, be overwhelmed by this problem. I would like uh, to note that world uh, capitalism that the leadership of the private world initiative is something that we should focus on. In Colombia, we see that in certain areas of the world capitalism and in certain governments and enterprises, we're being very permissive in terms of the new communists and communist groups. Many countries and many enterprises uh, have uh, tolerated these governments and uh, 
they feel that these governments will respect their rights. But this is not true, because these governments uh, do not view themselves as reproducing the old communist styles. But actually, this is what they've been doing. President Kennedy told humanity at some point that those who intend to ride on a tiger will end up being uh, eaten up by this tiger by this tiger and those that uh, believe that they can tolerate uh, uh, this new type of communism and these uh, dictatorships that restrict freedom at the end uh, will end up uh, being defeated by them because these governments do not respect the private initiative and we will end up being accepting these governments and we will be putting an end to private initiative. So let's be aware that we have to be able to try to overcome this. The only risk that you uh, face in Colombia is the risk of wanting to stay. Professor Schwartz had uh, said that we could not uh, take more than 550 uh, people attending this World Economic Forum. But Professor Schwartz, please uh, do us a favor. We would like uh, these 550 people who have uh, come at this point uh, to our forum, we would like to see them uh, as in the future being ambassadors of Colombia and that they will invite other people to come to our country in future. Thank you very much. Uh, President Uribe, thank you very much for your words. I think that this has sent a very clear message uh, to the region, and uh, it is that countries can be transformed. It can be done, and it can be done in a legal way and respecting pro private property based on solidarity. And above all, that it can be done under true leaders and important leaderships. So we shall now continue with this panel discussion. We have two important leaders from, from the private sector and another regional leader who is a part of the young global leaders of the World Economic Forum. I'd like to acknowledge uh, Governor Enrique Peña Nieto who, together with uh, President Uribe, is one of the most uh, popular politicians in Latin America, particularly in his country. So I'd like to welcome the governor. Governor, yo le pediría... Governor, I would like to ask you to share with you uh, your views in terms of which do you feel are the big challenges for Latin America at this point in time, and how would you confront these uh, major challenges, uh, taking into account your political future at a regional level and at a federal level in Mexico? Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. I'd like to avail myself of this opportunity to acknowledge uh, the President of the Republic of Colombia for his hospitality and for uh, being a fantastic host. We'd like to acknowledge the Colombian people for being wonderful hosts. Thank you, President. We've heard with uh, great interest the message delivered by the President of Colombia. And we fully agree with many of the things that he has said. But I'd now like to focus on the question that has been addressed to me by Emilio in terms of how do we view Latin America? How do we in Mexico view Latin America? And based on the experience that we've had in Mexico, which is the uh, uh, country in this part of the world that has more people and uh, we are a state, a state of contrast. We are a state with 15 million inhabitants, and we contribute with close to 
10% of our national wealth. Under this viewpoint, we feel that Latin America and our country has uh, ahead of it uh, many challenges. And we uh, are playing a very important role in this new millennium. We are celebrating uh, 200 years uh, in Mexico and other countries of the region that are celebrating 200 uh, years of independence. And this is an important opportunity to redefine our future and what we have to be, what, what we have to do based on what we've achieved. We are at a stage of uh, consolidating our democracy. We've uh, gone through different stages of history. Each uh, has had its own specific characteristics. But something that is uh, true in most of the Latin American countries is that we have adopted a democratic regime as uh, its uh, as, uh, as our type of government. So I think that it's very important to, to understand, to acknowledge that democracy gives result if we're not able to construct the legal and institutional framework that will make an effective state a possible, then I think that we would be putting the uh, political system that most of the countries in Latin America have adopted at stake which is actually democracy. Our, in our Mexican experience, we, we see, we view today that there is a very broad debate uh, in terms of how to organize uh, our different uh, political forces and political parties uh, based or uh, in the midst of this new democratic scenario. And in Mexico, we're introducing new reforms that will allow us to construct the very effective state that uh, our country, as well as other countries, uh, are calling for. Because I insist that the consolidation of democracy is very closely linked to the results and to the effectiveness that it can achieve vis-a-vis -vis the expectations of the people. It must be a democracy based on principles. It must be a democracy that be framed uh, in universal principles, uh, and also a democracy that uh, can show results. And the second challenge, because Emilio, you did ask me to be very brief, the second uh, major scenario is the economic challenge where undoubtedly the most recent experience we've had and following, well, following the economic crisis that uh, affected uh, the world overall and uh, most particularly the countries uh, in Latin America. Well, undoubtedly this, uh, we were able to confront this crisis uh, in better conditions uh, based on our experience of the 80s where we introduced reforms. Uh, some of them have not been completed yet, but undoubtedly this uh, placed us in a better position to confront this uh, uh, economic crisis. And uh, today, apparently, uh, and apparently as mentioned by Dr. Professor Schwab, uh, it seems to be very promising. And as a result of the uh, fall uh, in generation of wealth. Uh, we expect to be able to once again uh, grow, and hopefully this can be done in an orderly way. And taking into account what, what happened in the 80s where we abused of uh, credit, uh, we abused of uh, fiscal expenditure, and we also saw a situation where the state uh, became the owners of a large number of enterprises. Uh, and uh, I believe that this is something that we have to avoid. And I think that if we uh, are disciplined in terms of the current economic scenario, the future economic scenario will be very promising in terms of economic growth. 
And I feel, and this is very closely related to the consolidation of our democratic regimes, I feel that from the economic standpoint, we have to grow at a more accelerated rate, at a rate that will allow more wealth and a better distribution of wealth. Latin America is uh, not a role model in terms of uh, what we should be doing because we've had important uh, achievements but not enough in order to do away with uh, many of uh, our social flaws. So in consequence, the consolidation of our democracy will very much depend to the effectiveness of our states in terms of uh, producing results and in terms of uh, doing away with backwardness in Latin America, uh, being able to better distribute wealth and to fight against poverty. Thank you, Governor. We still have to consolidate democracy, and we can perceive the notion that there are countries in Latin America in which there still much remains to be done in this regard. Of uh, G International, you operate in more than a hundred countries worldwide. A few companies in the world that are so intertwined in, in, the, in the global economy. How have you seen Latin America evolve over the past 10 years? Emilio, if you don't mind, I stand up and I go to the podium. I am an Italian. <laughs> <laughs> I need room to maneuver. <laughs> I need room to move okay. about. Uh, Mr. President, honorable delegates, friends. It's a pleasure for me to be here to try to give you some ideas about the way that we see the development in Latin America. And to do so, let me spend a couple of minutes to talk about history in order to be able to analyze the present and in order to be able to give some requests for the future, for what we see is necessary for the future. There is no question about the fact that in the period of time between 2001, uh, between, excuse me, 1981 and 2007, the world has experienced a growth like we never experienced before. Several reasons for this growth, but I would like to point out the two most important, which were the introduction of new technologies. Think about the internet, think about telecommunication, and so on. And the big phenomenon of globalization, phenomena that has brought hundreds of millions of people to a new condition of life, and a large number of these hundreds of millions of people were in China and in India, which required a lot of commodities, a lot of raw materials, a lot of agricultural products. And where did China and India go to find this? They went into Australia, they went into Africa, and they went into Latin America. So this has created it generated a new wealth for this continent that associated to the fact that a lot, if not most, of the countries today have a democratically elected power. Now, the new wealth, the new democracy, has brought a condition of an economic condition and a social stability which this continent has never experienced in a long period of time. Now, we went through the crisis, and yes, we did have a crisis also in Latin America, but let me tell you, for somebody who has lived this crisis between the United States and Europe, here in Latin America was a very mild. I remember the time in the uh, end of 2008 or 2009 when traveling down, coming from the United States and traveling down to Latin America, it was like going to the moon. It was like living in a completely different environment. So now, in order to be able to maintain this pace, in order to be able to continue the prosperity of Latin America in the future, let me try to put some questions, some demands 
to many of the politicians that are here in the room, and not only to the politician, but also the people that in one way or the other are involved in the economic development of these countries. I think it would be very bad if in some of these countries we would return to democratic instability, political instability, or let's not even talk about dictatorship. As I said before, the social peace, the wealth created, has also been the result of a democratic process which is happening. Now, some of the democracies are young democracies. Some of the democracies are going through the learning curve of being a democracy. You know, democracy is something that people earn. It's not something that is imposed. But I am optimist about the fact that in this continent we will be able to achieve very good results. I think that another mistake would be the return to protectionism, the return to high import duties, the return to a taxation system which is not conform to taxation system in other parts of the world. I remember many years ago being in Brazil and talking to one of the prominent business people of Brazil at the time who was defending the fact that there were high import duties in Brazil. And my point of view was the one of, tell me a, an economy in history that has prospered putting big import duties or big taxation. I'd just like to mention a historical example which we all have in front of our eyes. Think about India. India up to 1991 was going nowhere. It was a socialistic republic, a more of a communist republic, with high import duties and an economy that was frozen. Then a gentleman by the name of Mohan Singh became the Minister of Finance and started a process of liberalization of the economy that today has led to the growth rate of 8, 8.5%. Eight today has led this country to a position where they absolutely didn't feel the economic crisis that we all felt. So let's get rid of some of this old-fashioned kind of limiting factors for the growth of the economy. There are other things that need to be removed, like, for instance, as I said, high taxes. Let's bring the taxes to the level of most of the developed countries. Bureaucracy and red tape, something that, unfortunately, we experience in many parts of the world, but it's something that with illuminated politicians like we can have here in, in, in Latin America, also following the example of President Uribe, for instance, things that can be taken care and can be eliminated. One other important point is the absolute elimination of corruption. Corruption is always a threat for development. Corruption is leading to uncompetitive environments. Corruption is leading to complete anti-economic misbehaviors. And unfortunately, we do, we are exposed in many parts of the world, but also still here in Latin America to this phenomenon. And I'm appealing to the governments, to the leaders of Latin America in this moment, to really fight against this enemy, which is the enemy for economic development. And of course, following up from the corruption, it is the concept of governance. Clean, well-constructed, illuminated governance is very, very important. We see it in the public domain, and we see it in the private domain. It has to be valid on both sides. Of course, we need to continue the investments. We see some great examples in investment infrastructure. President Uribe just mentioned, for instance, the construction of the road from the capital to, to, to the sea. I think that there are big needs of power, big needs of water for water, big needs for electricity, big needs for airport, for roads, and so on. And this needs to, be, needs to happen in order to bring these economies to the level where they can belong and where they can prosper. Another big request, and I think this is, not that the others are not important, but this is one that is difficult to put in place because the results are long-term results but it is very important, is education. You know, my job is the one of being the Minister of Foreign Affairs of General Electric. And, and I travel many countries, see many places, and I can tell you that the places that flourish are the ones that have the two E's 
is the E of energy, and I'm not talking about oil or gas. I'm talking about the capability of lighting bulbs and education. You see countries that got a lot of energy, but no education, they go nowhere. You see countries that have education, but no energy, they don't go anywhere. The countries that you see prospering are the ones that have both of these heavily invested and that are growing these kind of areas. Another point where I would like to appeal the, 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 the leadership of the various countries, and I think that President Uribe made a big case out of it, is the fact of security. Let's face it, but the prosperity of these countries is depending very much on foreign direct investment, on investments coming from all parts of the world. And if there is no security in a country, we are not able to do investments in a country. So it is of paramount importance that security becomes one of the top priorities. And as a last comment, as a last request, is the one, diversify your economies. I said in the beginning that the prosperity of this moment is due to the fact that there are commodities of any kind. But look, for instance, at the Middle East. The effort that the Middle Eastern leaders are making in this moment is one of moving from an oil and gas society to a society that is diversified, to an economy that is diversified. And I think that also here in Latin America, you, the leaders of Latin America, have to keep in mind that the prosperity is in a diversified economy. Look at what happened to the UK, for instance, that at a certain point in history decided that they were going to become a service society, and particularly a financial service society. Look what happened during this last crisis. They are probably, together with the United States, the country that was the most affected because there was not enough industrial diversity to pull back fast from the crisis. So, few things. These are motherhood and apple pie, as my friends Americans are saying. These are simple things, but I think that prosperity and success is always coming out of the most simple things that we can think of. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Re Mr. Recalli. Mr. McKay, um, CEO of SAB Miller, also an, another global company. We've talked about democracy. We've talked about the you know, business perspective of what we should avoid doing in the future and what we should continue to do in the future. If one adds up uh, those countries that have an investment grade in Latin America, more than three quarters of the regional GDP uh, is investment grade. That is notable, uh, even relative to other, other regions. Still, while not uh, being the poorest region in the world, we are the most unequal one. From a business perspective, what is spending? What can the private sector do in a better way uh, working with the public sector in the coming years? Hmm. Well, I think the, uh, thank you, uh, and perhaps before I say anything, I would uh, just like to echo previous speaker's remarks about um, our hospitality in Colombia. Thank you very much for having us here. I have also to um, acknowledge another debt to our hosts, and in particular to President uh, Uribe, because uh, in the course of our expansion over the years, which you, you mentioned, uh, Latin America has absorbed in fact, the bulk of our new investment, our biggest uh, slug of new investment over the last 10 years, we've put about $10 billion of new investment over the last eight years into this region, and a substantial portion of that, of course, into Colombia as the biggest economy, and the fact that we have managed to get a decent return and repay the capital on that investment is due in no small measure to the reforms introduced by President Uribe and his government. So uh, the company and I personally uh, am deeply grateful for, uh, for that. Um, the, we took a bet essentially on the region uh, some seven or eight years ago and it's been repaid handsomely so far. So the question is, is where from here? Your question was what can business do to help with this process? Well, there's no simple answer to that. Business does best what business does, which is to make a profit. 
and to do so in a sustainable way and in a, a way with, uh, which adheres to the laws of the local countries and displays integrity. Um, multinational corporations in particular are under intense multinational scrutiny, have to behave in a certain manner, which uh, in general, I believe, um, has the effect of improving standards of public life in countries in which they invest. I'm, it sounds a bit pompous, perhaps, but uh, in the majority of emerging markets, I certainly think that that's true. As far as this region is concerned, um, there have been very interesting discussions, points made in this uh, discussion now, and also one that I was involved in before lunch. And I'd like perhaps to try to answer your question by referring to that discussion, because it was to do with uh, trade and, and um, regional integration and what, is, what was necessary to get that done. And I was trying to make the point that, from our point of view, the biggest influence there would be for the individual countries to look to themselves, not to blame or, or wait for international trade agreements, but to look at local uh, obstacles to uh, efficient transport, to efficient uh, infra infrastructure, and so on. And the point could be made, and here I'm extending it, that if you look at the cost of our beer, which is what we happen to make, around the world, and you take a comparison of, let's say, any country in this region to the lowest cost production elsewhere in the world as a measure of some kind of inefficiency at each level of the profit and loss account. Very little of the extra cost here comes from tariffs. Very little. Most of it comes from internal hindrances within the countries. And those hindrances are infrastructure, which we've talked about and which President Uribe has referred to as a major point of effort for his government. But there are other non-tariff barriers all over the place to do with distortions, interventions, um, well, how to put this, um, generally interventions by government, uh, but also, and, and, and some of those come in, in direct and some in indirect forms. For instance, the, 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 the costs of transport, the costs of labor, the costs of starting new businesses, the costs of transferring businesses the cost of doing business in the, in the country. Now, we, because we make a very simple product, which is measured in the same way around the world, we measure uniformly by hectoliter, we can come to a very close uh, analysis of where the costs are different around the world, almost like an extended Big Mac index, you might say. So. If you were to look at, and I'm not volunteering our company for this, but uh, if you were to look at, at those cost functions around the world, they would constitute a very constructive and practical agenda for governments to look at their competitiveness. Because all of those distortions appear eventually in our costs. And everything that we're talking about at this conference, whether it be trade barriers or competitive or, or cost of doing business are all ultimately to do with the competitiveness of, the, of that economy. And I believe fervently as a private businessman that the only way to spread wealth in the country and to achieve uh, social and political stability is through broad-based um, economic progress. And for that, you have to draw everybody in and the economy has to be competitive. So. There are ways of measuring those uh, lapses in, in competitiveness, which I think all come down to cost and which are extremely interesting. What I think needs to be done in, in, this, uh, in this part of the world is essentially emphasis on three major th things. One is infrastructure, and we've covered that um, quite uh, adequately, and I, and I think uh, we've heard assurances and, and intentions about it. The second is productivity, internal productivity, which is what I've been trying to, to describe, some of the, of the hindrances to that. And the third, of course, is social welfare and social reforms. And I have to say that from where I sit, based in the UK, I don't think that the social welfare 
um, and social spending problems in Latin America are particularly different from those that I see in the UK or in, in Europe. I think we're all wrestling with the same topics. It's extremely difficult to reform educational systems. It's not a, simply a question of throwing money at it. Uh, it's a question of effectiveness. We were hearing in discussions before lunch about the, the difficulties of getting at uh, broad-based educational um, cultures that, that once they've become entrenched and achieving higher effectiveness. There's also the question of the sustainability of the amount of money that you do put to it and the, and the balance between short-term um, tax raising and very long-term returns that you get on it. The same applies to health. Um, we've all been mentioning and debating the, uh, the US healthcare reforms. I can tell you from my point of view again, the healthcare systems in the UK and Europe, many of them are unaffordable, creaking, and posing demands on the fiscus which are simply not able to be met uh, under, under current circumstances. So I don't think that those are, are particularly new or different challenges. They have a certain sharpness perhaps in Latin America. Um, they have a certain difficulty uh, and um, yeah, they are, they are, they are judgments and balances that have to be made by the politicians uh, in these countries. I suppose a final point that I would make is that I'm backing, we are backing this region to succeed. In fact, as, as I look around, not just at this event, but uh, in general at the performance of our businesses here, the rate of progress, uh, the rate of simplification, if you like, of, of business processes compared to that, those that I see in the rest of the world. The rest of the world is not just China and India. I think that Latin America is actually making pretty good progress. I think that uh, we should acknowledge that. Uh, we're probably still closer to the beginning than the end, and we never get to an end, uh, but I certainly think that there's no, no uh, need to, de to despair. And a final point, perhaps, I think uh, a great advantage that we don't acknowledge enough uh, in this part of the world is the common language, uh, and I think that that allows a commonality of approach and a commonality of view across the continent which I certainly don't see in the other continents uh, that, that we operate in. So I think that is, a, is a, a significant feature for here. I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Marquet. Well, we are running late, um, but this was a very interesting discussion and uh, very powerful messages, especially from, from various perspectives. Uh, I guess we can, we can conclude from, from what we have heard in this panel that uh, while the region has fared the latest crisis uh, relatively unscratched compared to our previous decades and other regions, there's still an important list of, of to-dos. Uh, we talked about democracy, very important. Uh, Pending item, infrastructure, competitiveness, diversification of our economies, focus on energy, um, and increase our regional integration, both in terms of infrastructure, in terms of uh, energy, but also in terms of political cooperation and helping the, the region move towards prosperity, but towards a shared and a more equal prosperity. Well, uh, please join me in th thanking our panelists and let's have a great rest of the program. From the capital to, to, to the sea. I think that there are big needs of power, big needs of water for water, big needs for electricity, big needs for airport, for roads, and so on. And this needs to, be, needs to happen in order to bring these economies to the level where they can belong and where they can prosper. Another big request, and I think this is, not that the others are not important, but this is one that is difficult to put in place because the results are long-term results, but it is very important, is education. You know, my job is the one of being the Minister of Foreign Affairs of General Electric. And, and I travel many countries, see many places, and I can tell you that the places that flourish are the ones that have the two E's. 
is the E of energy, and I'm not talking about oil or gas, I'm talking about the capability of lighting bulbs and education. You see countries that got a lot of energy, but no education, they go nowhere. You see countries that have education, but no energy, they don't go anywhere. The countries that you see prospering are the ones that have both of these heavily invested and that are growing these kind of areas. Another point where I would like to appeal the, 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 the leadership of the various countries, and I think that President Uribe made a big case out of it, is the fact of security. Let's face it, but the prosperity of these countries is depending very much on foreign direct investment, on investments coming from all parts of the world. And if there is no security in a country, we are not able to do investments in a country. So it is of paramount importance that security becomes one of the top priorities. And as a last comment, as a last request, is the one, diversify your economies. I said in the beginning that the prosperity of this moment is due to the fact that there are commodities of any kind. But look, for instance, at the Middle East. The effort that the Middle Eastern leaders are making in this moment is one of moving from an oil and gas society to a society that is diversified, to an economy that is diversified. And I think that also here in Latin America, you, the leaders of Latin America, have to keep in mind that the prosperity is in a diversified economy. Look at what happened to the UK, for instance, that at a certain point in history decided that they were going to become a service society, and particularly a financial service society. Look what happened during this last crisis. They are probably, together with the United States, the country that was the most affected because there was not enough industrial diversity to pull back fast from the crisis. So, few things. These are motherhood and apple pie, as my friends Americans are saying. These are simple things, but I think that prosperity and success is always coming out of the most simple things that we can think of. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Re Mr. Recali. Mr. McKay, um, CEO of SAB Miller, also an, another global company. We've talked about democracy. We've talked about the you know, business perspective of what we should avoid doing in the future and what we should continue to do in the future. If one adds up uh, those countries that have an investment grade in Latin America, more than three quarters of the regional GDP uh, is investment grade. That is notable, uh, even relative to other, other regions. Still, while not uh, being the poorest region in the world, we are the most unequal one. From a business perspective, what is spending? What can the private sector do in a better way uh, working with the public sector in the coming years? Hmm. Well, I think the, uh, thank you, uh, and perhaps before I say anything, I would uh, just like to echo previous speaker's remarks about um, our hospitality in Colombia. Thank you very much for having us here. I have also to um, acknowledge another debt to our hosts, and in particular to President uh, Uribe, because uh, in the course of our expansion over the years, which you, you mentioned, uh, Latin America has absorbed in fact, the bulk of our new investment, our biggest uh, slug of new investment over the last 10 years, we've put about $10 billion of new investment over the last eight years into this region, and a substantial portion of that, of course, into Colombia as the biggest economy, and the fact that we have managed to get a decent return and repay the capital on that investment is due in no small measure to the reforms introduced by President Uribe and his government. So uh, the company and I personally uh, am deeply grateful for, uh, for that. Um, the, we took a bet essentially on the region uh, some seven or eight years ago and it's been repaid handsomely so far. So the question is, is where from here? Your question was what can business do to help with this process? Well, there's no simple answer to that. Business does best what business does, which is to make a profit. 
and to do so in a sustainable way and in a, a way with, uh, which adheres to the laws of the local countries and displays integrity. Um, multinational corporations in particular are under intense multinational scrutiny, have to behave in a certain manner, which uh, in general, I believe, um, has the effect of improving standards of public life in countries in which they invest. I'm, you know, it sounds a bit pompous, perhaps, but uh, in the majority of emerging markets, I certainly think that that's true. As far as this region is concerned, um, been very interesting discussions, points made in this uh, discussion now, and also one that I was involved in before lunch. And I'd like perhaps to try to answer your question by referring to that discussion, because it was to do with uh, trade and, and um, regional integration, and what, is, what was necessary to get that done. And I was trying to make the point that, from our point of view, the biggest influence there would be for the individual countries to look to themselves, not to blame or, or wait for international trade agreements, but to look at local uh, obstacles to uh, efficient transport, to efficient uh, infra infrastructure, and so on. And the point could be made, and here I'm extending it, that if you look at the cost of our beer, which is what we happen to make, around the world, and you take a comparison of, let's say, any country in this region to the lowest cost production elsewhere in the world as a measure of some kind of inefficiency at each level of the profit and loss account. Very little of the extra cost here comes from tariffs. Very little. Most of it comes from internal hindrances within the countries. And those hindrances are infrastructure, which we've talked about and which President Uribe has referred to as a major point of effort for his government. But there are other non-tariff barriers all over the place to do with distortions, interventions, um, how to put this, um, generally interventions by government, uh, but also and, and, and some of those come in, in direct and some in indirect forms. For instance, the, the, the costs of transport, the costs of labor, the costs of starting new businesses, the costs of transferring businesses, the cost of doing business in the, in the country. Now, we, because we make a very simple product, which is measured in the same way around the world, and we measure it uniformly by hectoliter, we can come to a very close uh, analysis of where the costs are different around the world, almost like an extended Big Mac index, you might say. So if you were to look at, and I'm not volunteering our company for this, but uh, if you were to look at, at those cost functions around the world, they would constitute a very constructive and practical agenda for governments to look at their competitiveness because all of those distortions appear eventually in our costs. And everything that we're talking about at this conference, whether it be trade barriers or competitive or, or cost of doing business, are all ultimately to do with the competitiveness of, the, of that economy. And I believe fervently as a private businessman that the only way to spread wealth in the country and to achieve uh, social and political stability is through broad-based um, economic progress, and for that you have to draw everybody in, and the economy has to be competitive. So there are ways of measuring those uh, lapses in, in competitiveness, which I think all come down to cost and which are extremely interesting. What I think needs to be done in, in, this, uh, in this part of the world is essentially emphasis on three major th things. One is infrastructure, and we've covered that um, quite uh, adequately, and I, and I think uh, we've heard assurances and, and intentions about it. The second is productivity, internal productivity, which is what I've been trying to, to describe, some of the, of the hindrances to that. And the third, of course, is social welfare and social reforms. And I have to say that from where I sit, based in the UK, I don't think that the social welfare 
um, and social spending problems in Latin America are particularly different from those that I see in the UK or in, in Europe. I think we're all wrestling with the same topics. It's extremely difficult to reform educational systems. It's not a, simply a question of throwing money at it. Uh, it's a question of effectiveness. We were hearing in discussions before lunch about the, the difficulties of getting at uh, broad-based educational um, cultures that, that once they've become entrenched and achieving higher effectiveness. There's also the question of the sustainability of the amount of money that you do put to it and the, and the balance between short-term um, tax raising and very long-term returns that you get on it. The same applies to health. Um, we've all been mentioning and debating the, uh, the US healthcare reforms. I can tell you from my point of view again, the healthcare systems in the UK and Europe, many of them are unaffordable, creaking and posing demands on the fiscus which are simply not able to be met uh, under, under current circumstances. So I don't think that those are, are particularly new or different challenges. They have a certain sharpness, perhaps, in Latin America. Um, uh, they have a certain difficulty. Uh, and um, yeah, they are, they, are, they are judgments and balances that have to be made by the politicians uh, in these countries. I suppose a final point that I would make is that I'm backing, we are backing this region to succeed. In fact, as, as I look around, not just at this event, but uh, in general at the performance of our businesses here, the rate of progress, uh, the rate of simplification, if you like, of, of business processes compared to that, those that I see in the rest of the world. And the rest of the world is not just China and India. I think that Latin America is actually making pretty good progress. I think that uh, we should acknowledge that. Uh, we're probably still closer to the beginning than the end, and we never get to an end, uh, but I certainly think that there's no, no uh, need to, d to despair. And a final point, perhaps, I think uh, a great advantage that we don't acknowledge enough uh, in this part of the world is the common language, uh, and I think that that allows a commonality of approach and a commonality of view across the continent, which I certainly don't see in the other continents uh, that, that we operate in, so I think that is a is a, a significant feature for here. I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Marquet. Well, we are running late, um, but this was a very interesting discussion and uh, very powerful messages, especially from, from various perspectives. Uh, I guess we can, we can conclude from, from what we have heard in this panel that uh, while the region has fared the latest crisis uh, relatively unscratched compared to our previous decades and other regions, there's still an important list of, of to-dos. Uh, we talked about democracy, very important, uh, pending item, infrastructure, competitiveness, diversification of our economies, focus on energy, um, and increase our regional integration, both in terms of infrastructure, in terms of uh, energy, but also in terms of political cooperation and helping the, the region move towards prosperity, but towards a shared and a more equal prosperity. Well, uh, please join me in th thanking our panelists, and let's have a great rest of the program. <laughs>